Hello, everyone, and thank you for, for joining us for the second edition or the second meeting, if you want, uh, through our, uh, uh, our little, little series, series on the Black Sea. Sea. Um, this time, we will be talking about the troubled, the troubled waters of the Black Sea, which uh, obviously they are being troubled by the war, but also they are being troubled by a region which, which has been um, all the time between uh, different powers, has been seeing uh, times of peace and times of war consecutively, yet, however, has remained and remains a region of potential. And it may be, or you might think that it's a little bit um, hazardous to talk about the potential, the economic potential of the Black Sea when the war is going on, with a war that's going on, but it's never too early to start discussing um, about the peace that will eventually follow the war, as the, the, the sooner the better everybody hopes. So this is why our series on the Black Sea, um, it's not only going to look at the security of the Black Sea like everybody else, but also we are going to look at the potential uh, that, uh, that the region has, um, uh, economic, social, political, and so on and so forth. The first, the first edition in this um, in this uh, series of, look, of looking at the economic potential of the Black Sea talks about its most obvious feature, which is transportation and its potential as a transportation hub from the east to the west, from west to the east, but also north, north and south. Um, to to look in, to look at this, we have three wonderful speakers. Uh, from uh, two from the region and one with with extensive experience in the region, yet living outside of the region, at least for now, you never know. Um, who uh, who know all of the three speakers know the know the situation very uh, uh, very well. And I will start with the first one, with the first speaker, and I will ask um, Ambassador uh, Robert Chikuta, who. Um, as I was saying, has worked in the region, knows the region, to tell us a little bit how you see, with all your experience um, and looking at the at the Black Sea for so long, how do you see the, the the Black Sea developing as a transportation hub? How do you see its uh, its its transportation potential? Uh, well, from where I sit now in uh, in the U.S., but uh, with your experience, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alina. And thank you to the German Marshall Fund for organizing this event. It is extremely timely, I think, and frankly, probably overdue. Um, I think, first of all, I think it's essential that we look both at the evolving geopolitical role of the Black Sea and also its changing role in global trade. Um, it's essential that we look more at the Black Sea and its transport systems, transport routes as a system. You know, we've often sort of looked at the individual countries, but how do the countries interrelate and how do they link in with global uh, needs, global transportation systems, and also how those systems are evolving. Um, it's also, I think, important to look at how the different pieces can and should complement each other to boost the security, to boost the prosperity and the well-being of the countries littoral to the Black Sea, and also to the countries upstream from them and to the region as a whole. For a long time, I would argue that the United States government looked at specific factors at play in the region, Russian ambitions, Turkey's important role as a NATO ally and its responsibilities regarding the Straits, the need to foster peaceful development of the Balkan countries and their integration into Euro-Atlantic structures. Um, the role of the Caucasus as a transit corridor and its importance, the importance of this whole region in global energy supplies. But I don't think the U.S. has paid adequate attention to the Black Sea region as a whole and to its role in the overall global picture. A couple of things have come up in recent years. First of all, sort of forced us to, I think, start paying more attention. One, China's Belt and Road Initiative and the geopolitical, also secondly, the geopolitical earthquakes produced by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Those things have shown the inadequacy of this last, uh, this lack of focus. We're sort of been playing catch up. And that's good, but we need to take a more forward looking holistic approach in evaluating and updating the region's transport facilities and its systems. Black Sea realities have and continue to change. Actions by countries in the region, by governments as well as the private sector in these countries, 
are increasingly urgent as the Black Sea's role as a crossroads for trade, for communications, i.e. I, fiber optic cables, um, and for energy supply infrastructure grows. It's a critical component in the middle corridor, that growing surface transit route connecting Western China and also India and Pakistan with Europe via Central Asia and the Caucasus. This is a route that avoids crossing either Russian territory or Iranian territory. It's important because of the growing development of Western China and India, but also because of the desire and the need of countries like Poland, countries of the Balkans, um, for routes that can get to markets in Central Asia and so forth that doesn't cross either Iran or, or Russia. Um, we also need to keep in mind the fact that Russia has periodically blocked access to countries um, in recent years. Um, this Black Sea is important too for the Balkans and for others in Central um, and Eastern Europe for their own imports, their own energy security, their own trade and their prosperity. Um, and again, we just have to come back to the reality that Russia's unwarranted war and Ukraine highlighted the Black Sea's global importance in food, fertilizer, and fuel supplies. But something else I should also mention here is the Black Sea's place in the military defense security picture of many countries in the Balkans and the Caucasus. And again, this is something that gained great attention um, after Russia's 2008 invasion of uh, attack on Georgia. And as far as the United States is concerned, I think something that's important to note is that Senator Shaheen and Romney, Democrat and Republican, um, included language in the omnibus budget bill at the end of 2022, requiring, requiring the Secretary of State to develop a security uh, uh, plan uh, regarding uh, report on the security of the Black Sea region and looking at ways to increase economic ties, to enhance security assistance, and to bolster democratic resilience. Now, ambassadors love the geostrategic, and we talk in very, very broad terms, but I think it's important to sort of move this discussion um, from the broad geostrategic and the macro trade and economic picture and try to focus on some specific roles Black Sea transport routes and facilities need to play and what can be done, including by the United States. Um, I'm going to toss out three specific areas, I think, that can help address the geostrategic picture, while also improving the commercial picture, the employment opportunities, and the overall livelihoods and prosperity of people in the region. One, one such step is developing facilities where the secure, ongoing uh, supplies of diesel, gasoline, fuel oil, and other refined oil products to Ukraine the pro these are products Ukraine needs today, developing a system that will supply them today and for the foreseeable future. The way to do this, the way to do this is utilizing Romania's port facilities to establish a strategic supply reserve for Ukraine. Now work is already underway on a new 50,000 metric uh, ton storage tank in Constanza's South Port. It's got the environmental studies and the other prep work that's been done there it could be possible to build additional tanks quickly, quickly. They would provide a needed strategic reserve and supply system for Ukraine. You could build another 50,000 metric storage tank. You could get a couple uh, 35,000 metric uh, storage tanks, which would create a reserve of about 120,000 metric tons. Such a project would could be relatively undertaken and as a public-private partnership, perhaps, and could be realized and would have a definite impact in terms of Ukraine's stability and regional security and, and global uh, well-being. Now, a second project, I might, uh, second uh, concrete step we might be able to take would be to increase the overall capacity of Constanza's port. The port is one of Europe's 20, 20 largest and it's congested. One study I found by Dr. Uh, Romeo Kjortan, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name, According, says, quote, according to studies undertaken by foreign and Romanian experts, it, experts, it's necessary to urgently create and constant support in new operating facilities. Now, in addition to what I was just talking about in terms of using Constanza as a key part of a strategic energy supply system for Ukraine and perhaps for other countries in the region, the port needs expansion to be able to take advantage of the growing trade in the region and to support the Black Sea's overall development. 
Curtin's study notes the need to create a new, more, new mooring facilities, in particular for high-capacity seagoing vessels, perhaps ships for up for 100,000 deadweight tons, at Constance's South Port, where the depths allow. Improved and expanded road and rail access is necessary, along with this mooring, increased mooring capacity. The third thing I would suggest looking at are steps to upgrade and expand ports on the Danube, moving a little bit, not just on the Black Sea itself, but moving more inland. In preparing for today's discussion, I came across an item dated December 7, 2022 on Lloyd's List with this very, very blunt statement. Quote, the ports of the River Danube are busier than ever, but operational capacity has been limited by infrastructure not designed for the influx of goods and vessels calling at the ports. New policies and projects are improving the efficiency of this critical supply route, end quote. Now, some of work along these lines has already occurred. For example, the rail link between Galatz and Ukraine has been recently strengthened to allow Russian-Ukrainian gauge uh, uh, trains to connect to the port without having to stop and have the gauge adjusted. Uh, sir, if, 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 sorry to interrupt, but I, I would like to, uh, after you finish your sentence and your idea, I would like to stop here because I'm sure that you'll we'll come back to the issue of the Danube and I do not want to okay. take too much time discussing the, the river, which is important, but actually focus, uh, focus a little bit more on the sea. And I got the three projects and the three ideas that you, that you suggested, which is developing the port of, uh, the port of Constanza, uh, developing, um, which is congested, developing it further so to better connect to to uh, to 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 infrastructure, uh, hence to Europe, um, and also look a little bit at the Danube and utilize its its capacity, its transportation capacity. Also, very much, um, I liked, and I I do want to come back uh, in our discussion to the idea of the stability and security of Ukraine in a stable and secure region, which. I agree with you. It's the only way to have a secure, uh, a secure Ukraine. Um, and I can do I, want to move I, on. What, what, I just ahead, one last thing. In this, I think we can get support from the United States government in terms of financing because all of these projects are going to need money. Well, there are European funds that could probably be and should um, uh, used as, as well. well, but that, that's another conversation. We were talking about the three C's earlier, three C's initiative earlier. So um, there's another avenue. I do want to move on, move to the next speaker, who is uh, from Romania, Julian Kifu, he's a special advisor to to Romanian Prime Minister, um, and also take your uh, take your impression and your opinion, um, Julian, about the. Uh, uh, Trust the, the capacity, the potential of the Black Sea as a transportation hub, be it further developed, again, in times of war as in times of peace. Thank you very much. Hope. Hope we can hear ourselves. Hello, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. So I will split the issue in two. One is security and the second one is uh, projects of transportation. In both cases, they are interlinked for sure. With the security part, it's first and foremost because of the war, there are various, um, how should I put it, um, um, subjective areas of, of the whole Black Sea, especially in the northern part of the Black Sea, who are blocked due to um, so-called exercises or um, shots of uh, rockets, of uh, missiles, so on and so forth, that Russia is abusing on a daily basis and, and, uh, and has blocked in that reason several times uh, the port of Odessa, for sure, uh, Nikolaev and, and the others are not uh, on board as well. So one is the freedom of navigation. And in that area, uh, this is completely linked also to this type of blockages, no so is except the green initiative, green initiative, which is also very hardly hit due to um, postponement or blockages that happened in Istanbul for a number of vessels to enter the Black Sea or on the country to exit. So the control there made uh, by Russians together with Turks, with UN is, um, and, and is always delayed and it harms even the very thin part that succeed in, in uh, moving from Odessa to uh, via Istanbul and so on. 
The second point that we need to discuss is Montreux. As you know, Montreux is related to the moments of war. It's true that there's an interpretation only when Turkey is involved, but anyway, the agreement uh, uh, blocks the capacity of entering of, uh, for all, all the ships inside foreign, if you want, not from the locals, from the riparian countries in the area of the Black Sea. Uh, it helped at a large respect with a number of Russian uh, ships who were uh, sent back if they don't have uh, the port of origin here in the uh, Black Sea. But on another point, it blocked also any type of attempt of making any exercise in the region, any manifestation and presence of NATO inside the area. And it, at some point, we also had problems with uh, putting out of the Straits our own vessels or coming back our own vessels participating to different other uh, operation, even though we are a, a, a literal country. So that's one thing. And we also have two types of debates. One is NATO EU a literal organization. They should be allowed to enter and to stay more than 21 days or how it apply, how we can flexibilize that. The second discussion, it's not for today, but it will come very soon. It's Istanbul Channel. What is the situation of Istanbul Channel? Is it fitting under the Montreux Convention or not? Now, let me move to the transportation. There are two major projects. One is the East-West Strategic Corridor, Black Sea, Caspian Sea. In that region, we do have on the table a number of agreements for transportation. Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Romania. It's already signed. It goes for number of uh, merchandises, but also in energy transportation. And Kazakhstan, who wants to go on board also uh, for its oil first the, via the BTC, but also uh, for its other types of merchandise and to have also an agreement with Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia and Romania, it's the easiest way to move towards uh, East and Central Asian countries, generally speaking, are interested for using this uh, a corridor, the mid corridor at some would put it. Uh, the second very important projects are linked to the EU and are already on the table. They have been signed last year, the last months of last year. It is about the electric cable on green energy that is supposed to come from Azerbaijan, Georgia, via the Black Sea, Romania and Hungary. They are the signatories together with the EU Commission. The other one, which will be even faster than the 2027-28, that one is the cable for data east-west, also coming from those regions. Besides this, there is uh, already on the table, it's an old project, but now it's back on, uh, on the table, meaning um, uh, financing the feasibility study is the east-west energy uh, LNG, meaning uh, gasification, gasification and degasification with uh, Kulevi and Constanza ports. Um, feasibility studies involves also uh, Azerbaijan uh, for the whole process, but George, a Georgian company has been selected to do that the next 10 months. So we are already here. I will say a, a few things about the transportation via Romania of the grain. As you know, we have transported in 2022 11.5 million tons. It's more than 60% of all the exports of Ukraine. It has been done the biggest part of it via roads and railroads and to the ports. The Porto Constanza is uh, quite well developed and there's room for, for improving and for enlarging because it's true. Um, uh, at this increased level of capacity, we have a lot to do, beginning with the border passing. We opened some new border passing. We are aiming at having 12 new ones. It's about the roads because actually they were never supposed to carry this among uh, this, this big amount of, uh, of merchandise that they are doing right now. It's also a matter of improving. It has been already mentioned the port of Galatsi, who has an exit uh, also to the sea. So actually, you can go with the ship mar maritime ships in Galatsi, uh, but also the ones in uh, Brela and Tulcha, which are the riparian of of, of the uh, Danube River. The problem is at that point that we have improved and extended 
on, not only the exports on, on grains, also the exports on other means who are far more valuable and give even more to, to, to Ukraine. But the problem is that, for instance, all the three, um, the three ports at the Danube, I'm talking about the Romanian ports, have decreased between 25 and 28 percent of their capacity in 2022 due to some other type of merchandise who has not arrived in Romania anymore, coming from Russia, for instance, or for that matter, from some types of products that can no longer be made in Romania and exported. That. So that would be the introduction, and, and I'm looking forward to see uh, the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, once again, very interesting. I'm, I'm sure those who are following uh, events in the region, other than security, other than the war, other than the maritime, um, other than the mines floating in the sea, um, know about these other projects, which are very important, which are very important for, for Europe, not only for the littoral states, um, electricity cable, the data cable, but those who are not as familiar with uh, with these projects uh, would probably be surprised to see that the Black Sea is, even, even in times of war, continues to be um, an important connection, could be even more important, but it is, remains um, an important connection between, uh, between East and, uh, and West, and I think that's something that we couldn't emphasize enough, because the um, Istanbul Channel was mentioned, not to mention the Montreux Convention. I would like to 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 turn to our third speaker, who is from um, from or at least in Istanbul, um, Yoruk Yoruk Isik with the Middle East uh, with the Middle East Institute. Um, I will be very interested. We'd all be very interested in hearing your opinion and if you can can touch a little bit about um, on the turkish opinion um on the potential on the, the uh, transportation potential of the black sea how does turkey see uh, this potential being developed or not being developed father yeah and i am from istanbul also and uh, i like to add to your uh, sentence uh, you said between east and west and it's also very important as the last events showed us between north and south because um, about the agricultural commodities and feeding Middle East and Africa, uh, Turkey Straits and the grain, agricultural commodities coming uh, both from Ukraine and Russia and into a certain degree from Central Europe, especially livestock coming from uh, Central Europe, is key that they are transported from here without interruption. With the interruption happening, we see that we are in, under immediate risk of um, either the prices are going out of control and the global south is getting priced out of the market. Um, the last events uh, really highlighted one more time the importance of the Straits and the Black Sea. There is no doubt about it. I think the people who follow the region, we were all very much aware of it, but um, you know the, uh, the, the massive, uh, outrageous, unlawful uh, Russian aggression towards its sovereign neighbor really brought to the attention that um, we need to pay more attention and more ready and develop new ideas how to respond if uh, unforeseen events like the last 11 months showed us uh, happen. Um, in my opinion, and I uh, here I, you know, it's, it's kind of easy uh, to come after two distinguished uh, speakers. They cover really excellent points, uh, but I will go first to the uh, respond to the uh, as observing the traffic here. Yes, our, I think Romanian uh, friends and allies and neighbors did an excellent job of bringing new ports into operation in uh, really in heroic time. I think in normal time, under normal commercial conditions, these ports wouldn't have come um, uh, this fast into the operation. But I think in real, uh, in real terms, nothing will replace the regular uh, maritime traffic operating freely from the Ukrainian ports. And here again, I'm a little bit echoing what's been said. Um, there is, besides the events happening against Ukraine, there is a massive violation happening here of the last three, 400 years of understanding of international relations, which is the freedom of navigation. Russia is preventing the freedom of navigation in the Black Sea, despite the grain deal, and however successful we can make it operate, 
and uh, it it there is a massive issue here. We this is should be besides actually uh, this issue should be on the table separately. Uh, two countries, uh, uh, you know, can be at war, but preventing all other nations' vessels freely operating in the Black Sea, it's a massive issue and it should be an absolutely no, no, no to us. And here, I, um, unfortunately, I think um, Turkish government, because I think our threat of understanding of Russia for many different reasons, and there is lots of domestic politics here, uh, factor here as well, but our commercial relations. Um, in reality, the Black Sea should be open right now to the other world's vessels. This is just like, uh, you know, as especially there are two other uh, NATO countries in the Black Sea, just we are closing these entire Black Sea to the entire world vessels. It's a questionable decision. I think it was maybe done to um, not to uh, fuel the anger at, of towards like if, you know, it was maybe done to give a way out of Russia that, uh, that they are not feeling under threat or they don't use this excuse. Uh, but at this point, we are almost going into the one year and we see they are conducting, uh, you know, uh, a missile terror against civilian targets. At this point, um, we should reconsider as Turkey and as, you know, that uh, I think as, as, the, in, as a transatlantic family, whatever the discussions should start, that this decision has to be reviewed. And again, I'll come back uh, to my uh, Romanian colleagues' uh, points, uh, which is uh, very correct. Although Romanian vessels and Bulgarian vessels are, despite the closure, are transiting, especially for NATO uh, exercises in the Mediterranean, freely from the Black Sea. Those vessels are not prevented. So Romanian and uh, Bulgarian naval vessels are past transiting uh, both directions uh, through the Turkish Straits. Um, the, as we see that, you know, um, one more time, um, Russia demanded something they didn't have at the beginning, which was inspecting. They created a situation or they, um, they made an accusation that without any basis, without any real life examples, that the weapons will be transported to Ukraine uh, through Turkey Straits, through uh, this, in, you know, during the uh, import export process of the agricultural commodities. No such event happened. But you know, we gave in to their demands. We created this entire process, and what we are seeing right now is the they are not uh, genuinely in goodwill involving into the inspection process. The Russian inspectors are slowing down the process. They are inspecting heavily the vessels. It's it's almost became uh, like a joke that when Russian inspection team comes, they are inspecting teams like they are running a ship safety inspection. Russian team should only inspect if the ship is carrying. This is basically looking down through the hatch if the ship is loaded with weapons or not. This is what they should do. They shouldn't like, check other parts of the ship if the engine is working correctly. Or, <laughs> but uh, there is a deliberate um, slowdown of the process. And of course, when the deal was done, it was summer and it's, and you know, this is already a very crowded waterway. It is one of the world's most busiest um, maritime transit routes. With the bad weather, the process it slows down by itself also, and uh, <laughs> because it rains, the uh, when the grain comes out of Ukraine, it gets fumigated. It ha you have to air it. To inspection team can come when it rains, you cannot do it. But for the grain process to move successfully, you have to inspect at least a dozen ships. But right now, at, in a good day, we are in you know at six ships are inspected. But again, we cannot continuously rely on this artificially created mechanism to respond to an imaginary threat that Russia foresees. The, the Ukrainian ports should be open. The freedom of navigation needs to be reestablished. So these are key points here. Um, I like to make, um, so I, I'll, I'll uh, yeah, um, like one point that I like to respond, the Danube option is very good. But here, to bring into the discussion, I know you want to keep the Danube, but I, before I forget, I wanted to make that point that uh, like this last summer showed us um, an unforeseen threat not related to Russia, which is the uh, global uh, uh, climate crisis. You know, like the most of the summer we passed that the river level was too low. So like 
uh, again, this shows the importance of the Black Sea, uh, the establishing the freedom of navigation in the Black Sea, because we cannot, without even Russians, we cannot fully rely on the river system. NATO needs to come back if it's necessary, that's a key. And while Washington is very, uh, this is a major significant positive development that there is uh, attention uh, is now, there is legislation is getting uh, written about Black Sea because all my youth, all my like uh, earlier life, that Black Sea was kind of the end of the way, which is no longer, it's an opening route, opening gate to entire Central Asia and to the Silk Route, etc. At this point, we should remind to the uh, lawmakers and uh, back to in DC or in Brussels and that Caspian Sea also should be, you know, uh, should be part of this universe. There is real threat as we see right now, Iran is shipping weapons to Russia via Caspian. And this is like, this is an entire uh, joint universe that has to be envisioned for all kinds of security and trade issues um, together, but okay, I, I, we will discuss about other issues later yeah. on. I wanted to also say Canal Istanbul, if it happens, which I don't believe it will happen due to the economic crisis Turkey is in. This is a kind of fantasy project, but singly building a Canal Istanbul because Montreux covers Turkish straits in plural, the Dardanelles and Bosphorus. Just making one canal won't bypass Montreux. If you want to bypass Montreux, even legally, technically, you have to build two canals. You have to build another canal down south also uh, near Dardanelles, I will argue. But uh, again, that is, I think, a let's, less let's, important let's, issue. Yeah, let's not go too deep into uh, into, into Montreux right now, unless unless there are questions. And I, I, I should have mentioned already that um, if any of the of the of those listening, um, if you have any questions, please write them into the Q and A section so the panelists can um, can address them. Uh, but before um, anybody uh, writes a question, I do have um, a question to Ambassador uh, uh, to Ambassador Chakuta actually because we mentioned the Romanian ports, we even mentioned the Ukrainian ports, but there are other ports we haven't mentioned yet, which are the Georgian ports. Um, and they have their importance. And I keep um, my question actually to you um, is: Should the importance of the of the Georgian ports grow? Um, how would this impact the uh, the transportation in the um, in the Black Sea? That's a great question. One of the things I also wanted to address. Um, yes. Um, I was looking at, at, at the statistics, I think it was in 2019, the Georgian ports accounted for something like 1% of the total trade on the Black Sea, which is unforgivably small. But I think it's also um, going to change because I think as um, Dr. Ishak uh, noted, the growing importance of what's going on in Central Asia, the Silk Road, that middle corridor, which, you know, that end of the system really is Georgia. Now, the one big problem with Georgia is that the ports, again, the current ports are um, maybe need improvement, but also the construction of Anaclia was one of the things that was really being looked at because it was a deep sea port that would really be very helpful. That project is on again, off again, as best I can sort of figure out. Um, its construction would be very helpful because you need to have something going on both sides of the, of, of, of the Black Sea, not just on the um, Balkan side, but on, on the Central Asian side. Um, we are seeing, as you noted, um, Alina, the growing interest in Kazakhstan in trying to uh, find alternative routes to Uzbekistan, I think is also in that is, is also in that position. Uh, there's been good infrastructure that's been created, built uh, by Azerbaijan uh, across Georgia, the rail link, um, uh, Baku Tbilisi Kars Railroad. Uh, Turkey's construction of rails is important, but we need to be looking more at that eastern side of the Black Sea and encouraging the construction of new facilities there and taking into account where things are going. It's not just what's there today, but what we're going to need tomorrow. And when we're looking at the changing um, construction, the, the, the sort of industrialization of uh, Western China, the interest of India and to a certain extent Pakistan in this middle corridor. Um, it's important that we be looking at what could be done on the Georgian side. But I have to say, I think some of the political problems and so forth going on in Georgia are, are also uh, are slowing down progress that could be made and frankly should be made. 
Yeah, let's let's uh, let's take a question. Let's take the first question from our uh, from our listeners. Um, is there any possibility to open a discussion or a debate on a modification of control convention for military ships requested by NATO uh, littoral Black Sea countries? I think this question goes first to you, Rook, but then if anybody else um, of the speakers have um, have anything to add to, to what he would have said, uh, you'd be welcome. This is a, like a dinosaur of the treaties, right? It's signed in 1936, but it survived all these years. And it, when it was signed, uh, U.S. was in an isolation period, so it, uh, they were not on the table. So the sign is really designed to Soviets and Turkey as seen as the major powers of the Black Sea. So um, I think, of course, everything is on the table, I think, in my opinion, all the time, right? Uh, this is, unfortunately, this treaty is also part of the, because of the domestic, uh, domestic policy turmoils in Turkey, that never ending domestic political dramas. This is a part of the uh, domestic policy issues of the, also these original treaties of the Republic. So this is a touchy subject, uh, but I think everything can be, you know, no, nothing can survive forever. At one point, some issues can be discussed. And after the war, we're going to see a, a different uh, situation in the Black Sea. Russia showed us all their weaknesses. I mean, we're going to have a stronger Ukraine. We're going to have a stronger, fully integrated into the transatlantic family, a strong member of uh, Romania. So there is going to be a uh, different equation. So, yes, it has to be discussed. I mean, uh, uh, and this shows us one more time, one of the big negative situation right now that has to be corrected, that uh, the the endless tension of the recent years between Washington and Ankara. We have to overcome this. I don't know if Washington has to give a golden uh, parachute to Turkey, and at, I, I don't know, but when the Washington and Ankara are not aligned and, and that we are not putting our A game as transatlantic family in the Black Sea. So we have to improve our um, games. There needs to be a different approach. I don't know. This is, of course, very easy to say in a couple of seconds. There has been yeah. last uh, decade past intention, but this is this is an important issue. Um, it is an important issue, and every time I travel to I travel to Turkey, and every time I discuss uh, Black Sea, which is quite quite often, uh, this issue always comes up for 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 obvious reasons. I do have I do want to take another question, the second question, which um, actually goes to uh, goes to Yulian Kifu because it it is uh, it is relevant for Romania. The first one is very technical and very easy, and I think. Um, it could be easily answered. Do you think Romania will apply for membership in the middle corridor because Romania has not formally applied to this, um, to the Transcaspian International Transport Route? Uh, mm -hmm. That is, and the second uh, question, uh, Moldova is seeking energy independence from Russia, uh, especially for, from Gazprom. Uh, can you discuss bucharest kishino cooperation so that Romania helps Moldova secure new energy suppliers? Um, Juliana, I suggest you very briefly answer the second question because this session is not about energy, it's about uh, transportation in the Black Sea. Uh, but the first the first question is, uh, is very re relevant. So do you think Romania will apply for membership in the Middle Corridor? I think that Romania has the, the what, what it needs for doing its uh, transportation. As I already mentioned, the agreements are there. So I'm not very sure that entering into a different type of projects related to one belt, one road will ever be on the table of Romania, at least not at this point. Um, and then the third, the, the third question um, also for also for Mr. Uh, for Mr. Kifu, but I would really open it up to the to the to the to the other two panelists as well, because it's relevant. It is about um, an initiative which is very important for the region, which is the Three Seas Initiative. Um, what can the question goes? What can we expect from the next Three Seas Initiative Summit hosted by Buc Bucharest, because Romania is chairing the, the, the initiative this year? And what could be the strategic objectives pursued by Romania? So that goes to 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 Julian, but then to the other two. Given that there is this um, interesting and important initiative in the region, um, and given that. 
there is a strategy which is being required by the Congress from the administration. How are these two related or how could this be best related so, so there is a synergy between the two of them? So Julian, please. Um, Julian, can you answer the question? Can you answer the question about I what didn't the question? Maybe. Oh, okay, sorry. Yes, uh, let me read the three. The question again. What can we expect from the next three uh, CIS initiative summit hosted by Bucharest, and what could be the strategic objectives uh, pursued by Romania? Uh, first uh, first of all, I think that we have on the table a number of states that do not belong actually to the original three C's initiative that would like to join. Sure, first and foremost, uh, Ukraine, but also Republic of Moldova, and that's a decision that the original members should have. Uh, it also is uh, very much linked also to the uh, financial part, and we also have um, on the way some uh, developments. I will not enter into the details because actually they are still under a debate. Uh, involving, as you should know, uh, EU, US, uh, and some other uh, investors that would like to join 3 cities initiative, some of them not from the region and not from the, um, the original members of the 3 cities initiative. Actually, we do have on the table already a number of projects that should be uh, tackled and looked upon. In some cases, uh, some new ones would be added when it's up to possible new members that would be accepted in uh, with that occasion. So that would be the basic framework. Possible new members, financial part coming from different uh, uh, stakeholders outside of the region and the existing projects that would, uh, would be uh, uh, advanced because now with the financial part and with the capacity, we can move ahead as well. Um. Thank you, um, Ambassador Chakuta. Uh, would you would you would you want to pick up the question about best synergies between the Three Cs Initiative um, and the upcoming uh, required Black Sea Strategy, which is not only security, although the name says Black Sea Security Strategy, but it's more comprehensive than than only security. Yeah. No. Thank you. Um, I sort of tried to build on uh, on Ambassador Kifu's. Uh, points because I think to a certain extent how this develops is going to be is going to be a function of what the members themselves want and sort of what Romania can sort of bring in chairing the initiative this year and I think the the the, the, the big meeting is in the is I think in September I know it's in the fall. Um, no, these two initiatives should be complementary. Um, they should be working together, and I think it's also looking at the situation certainly today. And we're looking at the, you know, the, the, the question of, of Russia's aggression. We're looking at the security threats that are posed to everybody as a result. Um, looking at the need for Ukraine to be able to defend itself and, and, and encounter this and put itself in a position that it never is, faces this kind of situation again. But we're also going to be looking, I think, at a longer term situation. Longer term situation is, as we sort of already alluded to, economic which is the growing sort of return, frankly, of Central Asia, that connection across, you know, across Eurasia to the east and to the south. Don't ever forget India as well as China. Um, but it's also going to be the question, I think, of, of, of the various components of security and how economic growth, economic infrastructure fits in that uh, overall security picture. Um, that's one of the things that's really sort of going here and sort of, again, the integration of the countries. I mean, integration is always sort of a loaded term, I know, but the connections between the countries sort of reducing barriers, re reducing unneeded barriers, bureaucratics, improving customs procedures, all that kind of thing. Um, improving IT uh, communications systems is really, really important. Um, and sort of looking at these strategically, what crosses Russia, what crosses Iran, what don't you need to have do have that? What can you do to sort of avoid that situation? And I think also these these questions simply of shipping, and I think also the questions of uh, I'm no expert on Montreal, so I'm not even going to begin to try to go through the things that um, Dr. Zuck talked about. But um, you know, again, sort of upping the game on security. Um, for everybody, because this it, we're going to be 
I mean, I would I would love to see the war end tomorrow. Um, but whatever it is that ends, it's going to still be a difficult situation regarding Russia and how we're going to deal with Russia until we can get Russia into the system as a, as a normal uh, partner again. Um, so these are all going to be questions, I think, for the Three Seas Initiative. Um, and I think, again, coming back to this in terms of the Black Sea is a key component in that and sort of raising that profile. And I, I you know, look like a think to Bucharest to sort of try to to sort of pull that together in between now and now in the fall. But I think certainly there's a receptivity in Washington to doing more on this front. Um, thank you, Yoru. Would you, would you like to take this question as well? No, I think it's everything is discussed. I think we, let's move on to a different question. Uh, no, we don't have we don't have any other. Sorry, yeah. we don't have any other questions from the uh, from the from the participants. Um, and we are we are getting close to the to the end of the hour anyway. So basically, I do have one last comment, and turn it into a question for the so that, that the three of you, so that the three of you can um, uh, can actually answer. Because um, what we've been describing for the last hour is the situation of a sea which is increasingly important um, in its transportation um, role from east to west. And Ambassador Cecuta has very well put it as a return of Central Asia and an even uh, more important, if you want, return of, uh, of Asia, given the, uh, given the economic situation. But a sea which not only is at war, it has a country, it has a country at, at war, but which has been subject to limited freedom of navigation since 2014. Let's not pretend that uh, uh, the freedom of navigation has only been limited with the war in Ukraine. No, it has been limited uh, starting 2014. So you have a, um, a sea which is important, uh, but a sea which is at war and a sea which has been uh, where the freedom of transportation is very, very limited. How can this situation uh, be changed in the immediate future and in the in the longer term, so that the sea actually reaches its uh, its full full potential, and I will do it the other way around. I will I will start with Yoruk. In um in three in minutes the, mostly. Okay, uh, here we see the importance of Turkey in all the issues. We are at the center of it, and after you know we thought maybe we gave too much credit to the Russian armed forces. They had good ships. They have some working technology. But as we see in the how they lost Moscow, et cetera, the training one more time, if that ship was hit, a NATO ship was hit like Moscow was hit, it wouldn't have sunk. They have time after time, they're failing in the training on the standard of procedure, how to respond, et cetera, et cetera. So here we have the strongest Navy, in my opinion, after this war ends, is going to be in the Black Sea, it's going to be the Turkish Navy. So uh, Turkey is... Uh, is developing many of its indigenous technologies. And so we have to make a way that with the, uh, you know, with the Romania, Bulgaria, maybe without even, you know, overcoming the Montreal Treaty, et cetera, given these are big, important issues uh, to rewrite an international treaty will take so much time. With the leadership of Turkey, with the improved relation of, um, you know, uh, in the uh, reestablishing the working relation between Washington and Ankara, with already existing NATO structures can provide enough security uh, in the Black Sea. And um, because at this point, I think after this war ends, um, Russia is not gonna be able to make some of the threats that it was, um, you know, it was making. Now it's tested and it's not working out for them. So we don't need to be even offensive towards Russia. We just have to have credible force to protect the uh, the trade routes. And another thing, and I know you are not uh, keen about uh, working in energy, but here is in my last um, seconds, um, another big change is going to happen. It's the Turkish gas field, the Sakarya deep water gas field is going to come into operation. So there is going to be even besides the Azeri gas coming to Georgia and coming to Romania to uh, to liquefy, et cetera. There's going to be additional gas here, which is going to make all the equation even more complicated. Um, but it's it's going to change the traffic here also uh, on the Turkish Straits. Uh, there is going to be additional LNG uh, getting maybe shipped south. And maybe some American LNG will be coming one day to Ukraine. It's <laughs> it's going to be the whatever the issues are, the importance of the Black Sea in the transportation of all kinds of commodities 
is going to remain. So it's it's going to be it's going to be at the center of uh, many people, many capitals' attention. And one final sentence, really final sentence. If I was a message to Brussels, build for the future risks, build European gauge uh, railroad to the southern Ukraine to move uh, agricultural commodities. It will be as an insurance policy uh, towards the future. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Yoruk. Um, I do want to, to do a little bit of self self promotion here. Um, we are going to have we are going to have a session on a discussion a webinar on uh, Black Sea uh, energy and the Green Deal uh, in, in the, sometime in the next month. So um, yeah, we'll touch upon that issue as well. Juliana, I know that you can. Yeah, I, I I know you didn't hear what I said, but go ahead and do your final uh, your final okay. remarks. So the same uh, on the same question, I think that the most important part is to have a strategic interest in the region. So it's very good that NATO approved the Black Sea as being a strategic region. It's very important that the U.S. has under discussion at least one project in the in the Congress and another one who is inside the State Department in such a way of drafting its own uh, perspective. It's very important that we have uh, France on board as well as Germany with their own strategies on the wider Black Sea region. And this would help once those types of interests are drafted, uh, the other types of involvement will be there. Unless um, uh, we are, if we are just letting it for the companies or just for some other projects, it will be far more difficult to build up. So I will, I will, uh, uh, say that those uh, strategies and involvement of the big big players would be uh, <clears throat> tremendously important for that development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian, especially as I know you can't really hear us very well. So it's been a lot of uh, technical uh, details that we had to juggle with. So thank you. Um, thank you as well. Um, it is it is uh, it is very important, as you said, to have a strategic for the big players to have a strategic interest in the uh, in the region. That why that is why economic investments are very important because they can also trigger they should trigger um, even uh, even more stability and uh, and security. Um, Ambassador Chekuta. Um, thank you very much. I think the a couple things I would probably just sort of say. I think building on what's been said so far. One is the need to think realistically. Um, I've spent a lot of time on energy, so I tend to get nervous with some of the ideas that are being kicked around. There's what we'd like to see and what is practical. Um, in that regard, I think it is really important to be engaging in the discussions, engaging the private sector um, on what's going on, how they see how they see trade developing, how what they see in terms of things that are inhibiting them, often may be very small, but they can be significant. Um, That'd be one thing. Second thing I would look at is the role of NATO and the um, how NATO has stepped up and the members have stepped up, Romania, Bulgaria, as well as Turkey, have stepped up in, in recent years in terms of things to improve the security of the region, positioning um, exercises, things on that order. That is also something I think that needs to be really looked at. And finally, I think, again, come back to this question of the infrastructure. The infrastructure in terms, yes, of energy. Um, I'm not sure about the practicality of LNG terminals on either side of the thing, just because it's at $5 billion a crack for you know facility, it becomes hard. And until Turkey disagrees to let LNG flows through the straits. It's going to be another another issue, but pipelines will re remain important. Um, as as Professor Usher, you know, noted, um, the the developments of, of things in the of, of Turkey are going to be huge, and that's going to free that's going to a Turkey desperately needs gas. It's going to free up gas for other markets as well. Uh, pipelines will remain important. Fiber optic cables across the Black Sea. Looking at developing those, developing that infrastructure that's there. And I think, again, thinking in terms both of what's needed now, taking steps that can be realized now to increase and improve the transport within transport systems in the Black Sea and in the hinterlands. So again, you know, Serbia, other countries that really depend on the Danube as a route in Moldova, um, you know, looking, looking at those. 
but also looking further down the pike and again, realizing the expense of capital projects and how long they last. Um, one final thing I found, I want to sort of end with this quote, great quote, we're talking about ports, which is the ship doesn't wait for the ports, it's the other way around. So it sort of comes again to the to the, that development of infrastructure and working on that. And I think trying to get others that sort of help both private and governments and, inf and, and the international financial institutions to do what they can to help develop this area. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It is about investment and it is about infrastructure, which also has to be protected. Uh, but it's also about an area, a zone, which is, which is at war um, and which, by the way, has been proven to be all of the countries in the region have proven to have a high solidarity with, uh, with Ukraine, which I think it's it's extremely important. I shouldn't be forgotten um, during the war, but also when the reconstruction of Ukraine actually uh, actually starts. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Lian. Thank you, Rook. Um, thank you to those who uh, who who are following us. Um, and as I said, I, I have to advertise again. We'll continue the Black Sea series. Uh, we'll we'll have high level conversations with ministers and probably even prime ministers in the region, but also an upcoming session on the Black Sea energy and uh, um, and the Green Deal um, and more to follow. Thank you again and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.